Hello, Yervant. So nice of you to join us on Mindful Leaders and Inherited Legacies. And thank you for welcoming us to your home in Yerevan. You've had a very rich career. You've held um, positions in business management and leadership. And a few positions that come to mind in your, in your journey has been how you led the innovational transformation of Boston's histor historic Parker House, which is currently uh, a Harvard Business case study. Uh, you were president of Omni International uh, Hotels. And recently, these past few years, you are the chairman of the advisory board of the National Association of Armenian Studies and Research. Or as they say, Armenian Studies, or NASR. That's the, that's, that's the acronym used. So with such a rich um, portfolio, tell me, what are the principles by which you've led? What are the leader values that, that you've held that were prevalent for you during your, your professional and your personal journey? And what lessons have you learned? Well, you know, I always uh, had the determination to do well and to always to make sure that I do further better as life uh, went on. Um, I, was grow I was grown with uh, uh, determination to always win at, at the sports. And uh, when I uh, started my professional uh, career, um, I f at first I didn't know uh, what ca I could do. Even though I had tremendous self-confidence, uh, I at the same time uh, was wondering whether I will do well. And um, the first uh, year, actually the first eight months, proved to me that I could do uh, anything and uh, that I uh, could excel. And part of that was um, my mentor, uh, the, my first boss, uh, refused to accept that I couldn't do anything. Mr. Ben, ben Asfazaturov. Yeah. He uh, was an Armenian, which initially I did not know. And um, I, one day I said to him, Mr. Ben, we used to call him. That's why I didn't know whether he was uh, Armenian. Um, and I said, your, you know, your name uh, comes from an Armenian name also, from Asfaz. And he looked at me and in English said, I am Armenian. And, um, but he did not speak Armenian. He, was grown, he had grown in uh, Russia, in Moscow. As a matter of fact, he said his father was a mayor of Moscow at one point. And uh, he, had, he had always the, the attitude that, uh, that I could do everything, anything. And he did not uh, have the same expectation from the other uh, executives or trainees, I should say. So when um, the first opportunity came for a promotion, uh, he uh, recommended that I, I be the person. And um, shortly after that, uh, when he was m moving up, he um, recommended that I take his place. And now I was, you know, a young, college graduate starting uh, at work. And uh, within two years, I was basically training trainees. So uh, that gave me tremendous confidence that, uh, that I could uh, excel in the profession that I had chosen. So uh, that proved to be uh, a, a good uh, benchmark for me uh, to basically say, well, I could lead a company. And it was k kind of arrogance, I guess. <laughs> that's, that's quite honest. <laughs> here, I was, here I was in my early 20s, and right. I'm saying, you know, uh, I, could, I could be president of a hotel company. Which is what you did, actually, eventually. Yeah. But you, I remember when we sat together earlier, um, you, you had mentioned that you felt that you were pretty demanding. Your expectations were high. I mean, you, uh, at a young age, you already started leading the Mayflower um, and all these different, you know, international um, industries, like in hotels. And you felt that you were very demanding. And sometimes even people told you you were severe. Tell me how, looking back at, at, at how you started off and then how you evolved, um, were there certain things that you felt that, you know, um, were 
part of your nature? Was it something that you actually felt that you had absorbed uh, in your life? And how did you, how did you change um, your leadership style? Well, uh, I always expected uh, a whole lot from myself. And uh, at first, I, was, I would say when I was younger, my expectations from everybody else was uh, similar. Mm -hmm. And when I felt that uh, they did not do their very best, uh, that I would be very unhappy about it. And I always demanded. In many cases, when I was younger, I, my demands were probably more severe uh, than as I grew up and I got more mature uh, myself. And uh, then I became a little more understanding, but I tried to encourage without being severe. Um, and uh, that uh, was also... Uh, I also expected that from myself. And uh, if I said, if I did something that I wasn't very proud of, uh, they would haunt me for a few days. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would think about it and I would keep saying to myself, forget it, you know you made a mistake, uh, you, know, you learn from it. But then I, a few minutes later or an hour later, I would, it would also come back into my mind and I say, you know, I, shouldn't have, I should have handled that better or maybe I shouldn't have been so uh, difficult with a person or very severe with an employee. And um, this is something I, I don't know how it came to me, uh, but um, the only thing I can pinpoint is that I always wanted to win. You were driven, you were perseverant, is that, is that how? I, I, would, I would persevere and I would be unhappy with myself uh, if I didn't do well. Okay. Your earliest memory of the genocide was around the age of seven uh, in Palestine when your family would gather. Your parents never told you the stories directly to you or to your siblings, but you overheard them telling the stories in Turkish sometimes to friends that would come and visit. So um, your, both parents are survivors of the genocide, and I'd like to pay attention to your mother Mary or Mari. She's from Zeytun. She um, doesn't remember what happened to her family. She, the, the earliest memory she may have of the trauma of the genocide was waking up in a field with other children around and her family's not there. And so uh, she's, she doesn't have any recollection. She's picked up by a Turkish family. So she's taken care of by a Turkish family for a little while, and because she doesn't recall her name, she doesn't recall anything, not even her name, her first name, her last name, nothing. So the Turkish family actually decides to call her Miriam. Soon after, the Armenian community leaders uh, go around in all of Western Armenia looking for Ar Armenian orphans. They, they pick up your mother and they take her to an orphanage in Aintab. And there again, she doesn't know her name, but they change her name from Miriam to Mariam. She grows up in the orphanage. She becomes a teacher. And after Aintab, the orphanage is uprooted and taken to Lebanon. I'm telling the story because it's very, it's very similar to Carol Edgarian's story of Kassar, not remembering your name. That is probably a very hard thing for a person to live with, not remembering what your first name is, where your family is. And she, she lives the rest of her life not knowing what happened to her family, with the exception of knowing that her real name from other relatives is Zumrucht, Zumrucht Norashkharyan. And Norashkharyan actually historically was one of the five principal principalities of Zeytun. I'm, I've summarized your story because there are many other details, but I'd like for you to tell me a little bit more about your mother's story, um, actually how, what this story has meant for you all of your life, how you've carried this with you. Well, um, it's still part of my life, like uh, most Armenians who, uh, whose families went through the same kind of uh, experience. When uh, I was uh, seven years old, uh, the Palestinian and uh, the State of Israel uh, uh, foundation took place, we were displaced. And uh, we went from a very comfortable life to one room in the Armenian quarters of Jerusalem. And um, 
families would come together. Right? They didn't have telephones in those days. They would just knock on the door. They would come, and my parents, my mother would always be ready for, uh, with, uh, with coffee and with, des uh, with uh, dessert and so forth, just in case somebody came. And they would sit down and talk about this. And uh, they would, in many cases, talk in, uh, in Turkish. And uh, we would listen. We were in the room. We had one room. And uh, obviously, this made a tremendous uh, impression uh, on, on me and my brothers, my sister. But it probably made a, the same kind of impression with everybody else who was in a similar situation. And uh, a kind of, uh, un, I would say, uh, anger, per perhaps in some ways hatred, uh, developed. And uh, I always felt that uh, I had to do something. Maybe I had to come to one day and fight mm -hmm. for, for Armenia. But that was, you know, childish thinking. As I grew up and we came to the United States at age uh, almost 16, I began to learn about, about international uh, politics and international self-determinations. Self and uh, I began to understand that uh, there's lot, much less that I could do. Uh, and uh, I couldn't go and fight for it and that, uh, that we were controlled by major powers. Uh, and um, this developed into uh, a desire to see someday a free Armenia, but it was kind of difficult to expect that uh, because of uh, the world powers. Of course, uh, it was quite a uh, uh, good experience that uh, we ended up uh, with an independent country, um, and uh, and that made us very uh, happy. And we, uh, uh, I personally, uh, do my part in educating, in educating the world about the Armenians, and that's where I have taken the role as a board member and chairman of uh, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Um, I'm going to come back to the question about your drive, uh, being driven, being perseverant, you know, and your need to win, your need to... Um, I always find it interesting how a, a person's um, childhood upbringing with their history and with their family environment and their education, how much of these factors influence our own development, our own values, and the energy field that we grew up in. Um, I think about your father, Johanna, who also, at the age of 12, from Marash, loses his father. And he and his mother have to raise his own siblings. And so, like your older brother, he too had to start at a very young age to start working to take care of his family. So from Marash, during the second, mass, um, let's say, wave of massacres, your grandmother and your father and his siblings actually are in deportation towards Aleppo. And they live there for maybe 10, 12 years. This is before they actually move to Palestine. These are, these are you know, th the stories of Marash are important because you actually went with Sharon, your daughter, to visit these locations, looking for your grandfather's store, um, following the journey of where they've been. I mean, how much of that actually do you think has played an important part in your even professional life? You know, how much do you think of these, these fragmented stories and memories or narratives have actually shaped you as a professional leader, as a community leader, and even as a father? How, where is that connection? Do you see it? Well, I always felt that uh, because of all of that, uh, that I had no choice but to, to excel with what, whatever I did. Uh, I felt that when we were living uh, in the Middle East, uh, that we were guests in somebody else's country. And uh, our, 
I personally and many others uh, had the feeling that they had to do well, they had to excel. When I came to this country, uh, I, to the United States, I should say, uh, I felt that I didn't have any choice but to persevere, to do as well as I personally can, as my abilities would allow me to, uh, to do. And um, I think it was almost like uh, saying we have, uh, as, a, as a family, as a nation, have been uh, persecuted, have been deprived, that it was my role to do well. I didn't intellectualize that, mm -hmm. but I, I think it was part of my uh, being. When we got to the United States, my father basically said to my older brother, you have a profession, uh, you'll do well. Uh, you, look, you look at me and said, uh, I want you to do well with the rules of this country. Meaning you'll be an executive, you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll uh, uh, succeed, uh, succeed in a different way by not working, by not working with your hands and uh, so you do well in the school. So that in itself was a motivation for me. Right, right. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, uh, now looking at how, how much fear and anger and frustration um, and worry there is in our nation today after the Artsakh war, you know, and, you know, some of us tend to think, okay, well, we had a similar type of um, situation during the genocide or during the first Artsakh war or during the earthquake. I mean, these are just layers of different types of traumas that our, our people have gone through. Knowing what you know today, knowing what your family has survived, uh, what, what advice would you give, let's say, to your daughter, to other family members of what actions we could or we should take? At well, this point, I have I have always encouraged my daughter to uh, to be a good Armenian and to always excel in whatever she did, and and she has, and uh, she contributes uh, now. After actually, she she is in Armenia now with me, and she's working on a in a project, and the project is to improve uh, emergency medicine. medicine. Uh, in, in Armenia. Well, she could uh, be very comfortable back home at Yale University uh, teaching and practicing uh, emergency medicine, but she's spending a month here um, and three times, from, uh, three times uh, for a month to month and a half in working with the uh, American University of Armenia, Yale University, uh, Fulbright, and um, the, the National uh, Health Institute here in, United, uh, in Armenia. And she doesn't have to do that, but she's doing it. And I didn't tell her to do it. So coming to, the, to Nasser, you, um, I have a very quick question for this one. Um, Nasser has been a, an important part of your life as well. Uh, and w along with the executive committee and your other colleagues in the board, you were, you, you, managed to raise more than seven and a half million dollars. Um, so a, a very successful uh, fundraising campaign was taken, had taken place and the intention was to have a new headquarters for Nasser, which you now have. So I want to congratulate you on that. Um, you build upon uh, not just having the building, it wasn't just a beautiful building in Boston, it was actually you know, having an expansion of the different projects that you've been doing. You've actually managed with Nasser to help have more than 16 different Armenian study chairs in prestigious universities in, in, uh, in North America and in Oxford and in the UK. You have lecture halls now so that you have all these different academic even um, events taking place, a, a very modern library now. My point is that you've led this initiative uh, with your colleagues and with the community members, with the support of different Armenians. Why is this association so important for you? Well, you know, uh, the very visionary people, when I was a young man who founded Nasser, and um, I happened to uh, go to the first uh, victory uh, banquet, and the first victory banquet was a fundraiser 
uh, to establish uh, the first chair of Armenian studies at Harvard University. And I was amazed how, uh, how in, this, uh, in the United States that so many people, over a thousand people, could come together in one hall at the Memorial Hall at Harvard University and be so proud that at Harvard there will be an Armenian chair uh, to study Armenian studies. And that was the first one, uh, the first one. And, um, and after that, uh, another one at UCLA and, uh, and helped to establish a chair at Columbia. And after that, other communities started establishing chairs. Nassau did not establish the other chairs. So from that perspective, I had an interest uh, in educating the world, basically, about Armenians. Because when Nassau was established, there were only uh, a handful of uh, Armenian history, culture books um, that uh, existed. Today at Nasser, because of Nasser's supporting scholars um, in, in, uh, for writing books, for researching, there are more than 2,000 uh, 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 publications uh, at, at, at our bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, this was a major, major uh, initiative that, uh, that visionary people uh, had taken. So as time went on, uh, I was uh, busy working uh, in my profession. And when, when time came that I could devote some time myself, um, I was asked to join the board. I served on the board uh, for quite a few years. And uh, when I retired, I had more time. Uh, I was asked to chair the organization, and um, and I accepted. I've been chairing it for the past five years, and here uh, my personal uh, contribution, I would say, ha has been that I want to prepare NASA for the future. We're, what does that mean? Well, what that meant is uh, establishing a new headquarters was part of it. Uh, we had an old building. The library was under uh, conditions that uh, needed to improve. Uh, I want to raise uh, the expectations from the community that Nasser was here, but it had to stay here for many years after we're gone. Uh, and to, to do that, we needed to have an environment that was better than what we had for the books to be in an uh, environmentally controlled uh, uh, building uh, and for the library. And for us to become more global. And to do that, we had the most uh, advanced communications uh, uh, systems uh, developed in the building. And uh, I want to raise uh, the, the quality of, uh, of the of the research that takes place to support, support uh, uh, scholars all around the world, which we do. Right. And, uh, and each one of the, these scholars writes books, uh, are professors in universities. And so what's happening is the, the world is learning more about Armenians. In the United States, particularly initially, uh, people did not know anything about, much about Armenians, I should say. And because of uh, Nasser's uh, foundation, they began to learn more about it. The, um, I'm going to ask one last question, Ervant, and that's, you know, um, you, you, you raise a point how Nasser is actually putting Armenian studies um, uh, information about Armenians in general, politically, sociologically, economically, um, historically, on the international map. Um, yet I think about the, the emotions that take place, you know, and how fragmented or how divisive it just feels that we are um, in our own nation. What, you know, what type of, what type of future do you see um, in the next coming few years, even if we don't have a magic crystal ball to decide on what's going to happen, 
what, how do you see the future? What vision do you have? And what, what, what words of encouragement uh, would you give to your friends or other people who would want to support, our, uh, support Armenia in its own way? Well, I think uh, Nasser and other, other uh, organizations who have done scholarly work um, is absolutely uh, not only essential, it has helped Armenia. If you take the United States, um, the Congress would have known nothing about Armenians if it wasn't, it wasn't uh, available for them to, to, to read and write and for advocates to, to approach them about Armenians. Now, part of our, the research that takes place, part of the books that have been written, is, is, actually, uh, is actually supportive on, on advocacy groups. If you take organizations like the ANCA, the Armenian National Committee, or you take uh, Armenian Assembly, um, they are able to talk about and uh, about our, uh, to the, to the uh, congressmen, to the senators, about the Armenians, and to be able to provide them the history of Armenians, the culture of the Armenians, the identity of the Armenians, and what, what has happened to them historically, and where they are today as major contributors in their country. Uh, and this has really helped, I think, um, in give, giving support to Armenia. If there is a legislation that takes place, uh, and uh, we have, at times we have, uh, well, the recognition of the genocide, there was almost 100%, 100% of a vote in the Congress uh, for, uh, for basically recognizing what happened, which has always been uh, denied. And um, I think other scholars around the world, as they do work, it's, uh, it creates a very major uh, respect and, uh, and uh, knowledge of Armenia. Uh, and uh, I think that helps uh, to support Armenians, uh, Armenia basically, in their political uh, and uh, geopolitical uh, stature. Understood. Yervan Chekijan, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. I'm, I was inspired by your personal story. I'm sure many people will also be inspired. Uh, I look forward to seeing what you and Nasser will be doing in the next few years. Thank, thank you, you so Laura. much.